if you would like for how you want to manage the windows on your desktop. So if you want tiling, you can get tiling. If you want cascading windows according to class, you can do that too. So I'm making it pluggable so you can do whatever you want, as long as we write the rules. <laughs> when it's done. <laughs> I'm trying to get 1.3 of Lumina out first because there are some things that we need for TrueOS and IX systems for the current version of Lumina right now before I can dive deep into finishing up the last bits of Lumina 2. Yeah. So is that your own window manager? You wrote a window manager? Yes, we wrote a window manager. And it's actually embedded into the screensaver system, which we also wrote and is embedded into the Lumina binary, and the screen locker system, which again is embedded into the Lumina library and self-written so that you have total security control of the X session from start to end without using dbus or process injection to bypass things like your lock screen to enable access to your graphical desktop. Things like that. And this isn't even a Lumina talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We actually have it set up so that if you try to bypass the screensaver, it, I have working templates of Lumina 2 that I don't recommend anybody else run at the moment. Um, <laughs> but I do have the screensaver system and the locker system set up. I, I focused on the security of the session first, so that stuff is all done. And so I was actually doing full tests, and any time it tries to detect that somebody's killing or bypassing the session, it would rather close down your entire session rather than give somebody unauthorized permission to your session. Which is what you want, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's because of actually how the Linux desktops evolved in their ecosystem. They are designed as tons of various disparate utilities which are glued together via process, uh, cross-process communication through Dbus. So the moment you have a system like that, it opens yourself up to all sorts of, quote, man-in-the-middle attacks for the desktop and all these other types of injection attacks just to bypass your desktop security. All right, I think it's about time. I'll give people another minute, just keep rolling in. Y'all ready to get started? You all awake? You all have breakfast? <laughs> Those of you that like breakfast. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm not sure, are they recording me or just recording the slides? Do you happen to know? I'm recording the slides. You're recording slides. Yeah, I think everybody's recording. Oh, okay. I guess I'll just stand here then. So I'm sorry for anybody watching on the live stream. If I happen to wander out of frame, I tend to pace. <laughs> All right, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ken Moore. I am one of the senior TrueOS developers. I'm on the core team for TrueOS. Um, I wrote a utility called SysADM for TrueOS, but we have ported it to FreeBSD specifically for providing a static API for managing and administering your, your FreeBSD systems. So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today, and let's get started. All right, so I mentioned that we wrote it for TrueOS, and it's specifically for administrating FreeBSD systems. Because right now, if you are a FreeBSD administer, administrator, you have to know how many different tools, sysrc and the format of what needs to go in it. You need to know ifconfig, you need to know service commands, you need to 
I'm trying to think. There's a whole host of other things you need to know. All the various config files for all the various things like setting up networking and stuff like that. There's a whole lot of stuff that you have to do for each individual box. We specifically designed SysADM, and actually we got the start, the idea for SysADM came out of BSD CAN two years ago when I was here there. Um, we wanted an easy way with a static API to do all of the common system administration stuff. So that's kind of what bore out this project. And we decided to do it in three different pieces. Um, two pieces are the primary pieces. The third one's still experimental. The server, the SysADM server, is what you would download and run on FreeBSD itself. So that is FreeBSD specific. It's loading and using the FreeBSD C libraries to do things like um, fetch sysctls, or make configuration changes, or read information about your system. We use a lot of the FreeBSD C libraries. Um, and then the client is cross-platform. So we did this with Qt5, and we release versions of the graphical client for FreeBSD and TrueOS, Windows, and Mac at the moment, although some people have been asking for various Linux builds of it too. So that's just the general breakdown. The third project, which is still experimental, is the bridge. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but basically it's like an announcement server so that your servers and your clients can find each other if one or the other is behind corporate firewalls and things like that. That's the general idea. So let's go ahead and keep going. Let's go into the, dig into the server a little bit first. Um, this is the FreeBSD specific part. That's what I'm gonna mention. This is basically the brains. This is what determines what is available on your system, reads off the configurations, and really gives you the options for managing your server. So we have the server binary. It can be run in two different modes. We have it as an HTTP slash TCP server, and we also have it as a WebSocket server. And I have JSON and HTTP listed at the end there. That will come into play in just a minute when I talk about how to interact with these. Um, both of these types of um, runtime can be run at the same time. It's a single binary, but you simply launch it with a different flag to say, I want to run in WebSocket mode, or I want to run in TCP mode. And both of them will lift in on different ports, too. So you can pick and choose which one you want or run both of them at the same time, if you would like. But this is the thing that really makes SysADM unique among the various middlewares. That's basically what the class of application this is. It's a middleware. You talk to this, and then that talks to the operating system itself. What makes SysADM unique is that SysADM has no internal database. It doesn't just cache what you say you want it to do, and you have to start SysADM on your server again on Nextboot to reapply and reload all those settings in the SysADM database. That's not the way this works. SysADM actually is doing the actions on the FreeBSD system that you as a system administrator would do normally. So if you want to enable a service in rc.conf, for instance, as a system administrator through an SSH tunnel or something like that, you can do that and SysADM will be aware of it and if you ask SysADM to enable a service, it will do the exact same thing and put the line in rc.conf for you so that there is no loss of information or loss of functionality between all the various ways of administrating your FreeBSD systems. This makes it very, very useful because we do not replace your muscle memory as system administrators. We're not asking you to learn something completely new, we're just giving you a new tool to do the same stuff that you're already doing, maybe in a more sane or scriptable manner. So here's just a quick flowchart that I threw together just to show you kind of what the SysADM server does. Notice that it is a server. It is not using Apache, it's not using Nginx, it's a built-in self-contained server. And that'll come into play in just a moment. But we all use, um, I'll go into security in a moment, I'll skip that. Um, basically your request comes in, you have to authenticate with it. You have other, it also has blacklisting built into it by default. Once you get through that, it goes through some internal systems to see, okay, you know, are you saving SSL keys? Do you have an SSL key? Let's give you a token, an authorization token, things like that. But the real crux of it comes down to the external systems. We wrote this in a modular manner so that we can add whole new classes of API calls to SysADM without touching the bulk of the server or the bulk of all the rest of the functionality. This also allows us to turn API classes on or off depending on what is actually installed on the server. 
So for instance, I have, uh, let me pick one up there, data backup, L Preserver. Um, that's the Life Preserver utility from TrueOS. If you're running this on FreeBSD, though, you might not have that installed. If that is the case, SysADM will simply say, I don't see the L Preserver binary. I'm not going to let you access this subclass of APIs because the utility isn't there. So it lets us do it a modular way at runtime to figure out what is and what is not available on each individual server. And then we also have other things like IPFW management, uh, IO cage, IO hive. I'm actually finishing up the IO cage stuff right now. Uh, the TrueOS update system through PC Update Manager, things like that. And then it goes out and sends back replies to whatever you asked. So I mentioned security. This is one of the reasons we wrote our own server. Most servers that you have to run, you have to run other services to secure your server. Um, for SSH, for instance, yes, you can run SSHD and open up a port, but then how many other daemons or server services do you want to enable for SSHD to watch and do things like blacklisting and brute force attack detection and things like that? We wanted to avoid that, and so we wrote those mechanisms into our server directly. So the first thing we did is we require the latest TLS transport encryption, um, and this is through either HTTPS or WSS connection. Um, depending on which one of the servers you're talking to. Uh, we authenticate via username and password to the local system, just like if you're logging in via SSH, or we also allow an external SSL public-private uh, key pair exchange. So basically what that means is there is a separate certificate than the one that you use for the connection. There is actually one that you have on your system. And if you try to connect with an SSL cert, the server will say, hey, great, okay, here is a block of random text that I just generated. Please encrypt this with your private key and send it back to me, and I'll see if it matches one of the public keys I've got registered on my system, if I can decrypt it and get the same string back. And that's how it does it, but it's kept separate out of the current SSL connection, so it's a separate cert, uh, public-private cert pair. Um, we also have strict connection timeouts and blacklisting. So if somebody hammers your server and doesn't log in for, I'm trying to remember what the timeout is, for between the connection and the qu connection getting established and you actually have to log into the system at something like 10 seconds or something, because it, it's supposed to be automated. Um, but if they fail that two or three times, you can blacklist them for a specified amount of time and then allow that IP to start accessing again. That's all built into the server and configurable via the SysADM server settings. Um, privilege separation. We wanted to make sure, because again, we're coming from the TrueOS aspect, we have a lot of non-privileged users that are running FreeBSD systems on TrueOS. When I establish a TrueOS system and desktop and give it to my mom and dad, for instance, I don't necessarily want to give them root access to the system. So what we did is we actually wrote that same kind of privilege separation into SysADM. So we, it ha understands that if you are trying to log in, one, you need to have at least operator access to the system in order to talk to SysADM. Because a lot of the stuff that SysADM does is for managing the system, like setting up networking, setting up you know, jails, doing things like that. So you need at least operator access just to be able to log in. However, that gives you a limited access to SysADM itself. You need to be part of the wheel group on, free, on that FreeBSD system in order to gain full access to SysADM. And if you're part of the wheel group, you can do things like manage all the other users on the system, uh, manage who can log in and who can't, adjust the SSL certs for all your various systems. So if you're a system administrator, just make sure that you have an account with wheel on there, give everybody else operator access, but then you can go in and modify. It's like, oh, wait a minute, this user just got, um, you know, just left the company for some reason. I'm going to remove their cert so they can no longer log in with their SSL cert or their username and password and stuff. So you can easily do that as an administrator without having to go worry about all the other stuff if you leave yourself that access. Um, we also have the ability to disable username and password authentication, because I mentioned there's that or the SSL certs. You can require the SSL cert method. And this actually comes in really useful for the client that I'll talk about here in a moment. But basically require that SSL cert, which is predefined. All right, so let, now let's just 
what's the difference between the WebSocket and the HTTP server, okay? Um, those, how many of you know the difference between the different types of connections? A couple of you. All right, well, let me go through the basics. A standard HTTP request is a one-off request. You send a request, you get a reply, you close the connection. You, send, you establish a connection, send a request, get a reply, close the connection. So it's very much a one-shot type of system. The WebSocket connection, uh, by contrast, you establish the connection, you authenticate with it and do whatever you need for that, but then the connection stays open for a long period of time after that. So you can send multiple requests, get multiple replies back in different order, so it's all asynchronous, and it lets you do a lot more bulk communication with a system without constantly uh, opening and closing connections all the time and re-authenticating every single time. Um, so what this does is this actually adds a little bit more functionality to our WebSocket server because you can actually get spontaneous events from the system as well. Since everything is asynchronous and um, we can have the server send out you know, the 15 minute health check. It actually does health checks of your FreeBSD server every 15 minutes to look for things like you're running out of memory, you're running out of disk space, you're running out of, you know, whatever. There's a whole number of things in there. Your zpool is degraded. Um, and we send those out as global events to all clients that are connected via WebSockets if the client says, hey, I want to receive this type of event, and that's it. Because we have a whole set of types of events. You can get uh, events about various processes that are running and done and see their outputs and stuff. You can get events about very particular things. The health checks are one type of event. There's a whole class of types of events that are available through WebSockets, but aren't necessarily available through the HTTP protocols. So this is what just an example of what the API looks like when you actually want to talk back and forth. For the HTTP se session, you have your simple get, uh, namespace name, version of your HTTP protocol, and then your Base64 authorization, and then we use JSON for all of the standard input-output formats. So even in the HTTP, we still have JSON for the bulk of tech, the body of text. For the WebSockets, we chopped off all the top stuff, and it's all JSON. So what would correspond to JSON args on the right is simply this args object on the left for the WebSocket thing. So that we wrote, we only have to write APIs once for SysADM, and we really only need to look at the args object, which is the same across both formats. Um, the other thing that you see here which is different is the ID field on the WebSocket side, and that's because of the asynchronous nature of WebSockets. You can send in 10 different requests, give them all unique IDs, and then the replies might come back at different times, depending on you know, which one's finished sooner and things like that. So the ID gives you a one-to-one -one correlation of which reply associates with what request. All right, now let's just move on to the client really quick. I'll take a whole lot of questions at the end, but if you do have questions about this while I'm going, by all means, raise your hand. Any questions about the server before I go into the client? One, okay. We, I don't think there is. I, on TrueOS, we use it as the control panel, actually, on TrueOS systems, and you can do that without internet access. So I'm going to have to look into the way we instantiate the server. It might be available as a local Unix socket as well. I'll have to check on that, then. All right, let's move on to the client, then. So I mentioned that the client is cross-platform. It is written purely in Qt5. No, this is not KDE. No, this is not, you know, all this other stuff. It's pure Qt5, it's very slim. But what this does is it gives us the ability to use the exact same sources, the exact same program, and run it on different operating systems, such as FreeBSD TrueOS, Windows, OS X. We actually automate those builds all right now. So every time I commit to the SysADM, pro uh, the SysADM client, um, it automatically, our build system automatically spits out new images for every single one of those OSs. Um, this also brings along multi-system management. So while the server component is, by necessity, only talking to that one system, 
the client has an understanding that it could be connected to multiple systems all at the same time via WebSockets, let you receive events from all of them so you can keep track of your fleet of servers for those health checks that I mentioned, for instance. It'll send you a warning that, hey, server A is running low on disk space, or server B just had a disk fail and the Z pool's degraded if you're on ZFS, you know, things like that. So the client has knowledge of that. Um, we also allow the capability for grouping your servers. So if you know that you've got two racks of servers in your business, in your client you can say, okay, I've got these eight servers, but these four are in this one rack, these four are in this other rack, and you can actually keep them grouped up that way in your client so it's easy to access, figure out which one is which. And then here I just mentioned localhost connections do not require internet access. That's what we use on TrueOS. I don't know if it's the socket. I'll look into that though. Um, security again. Security is very, very important to us to TrueOS, so we try to focus on that for each one. So the way that we do the security on the client side is we do generate unique SSL public and private keys for the client the first time you start it up. And what this does, those are the extra keys that we use for talking to the, authenticating with the Cisadium server. They are not used to establish the, connect, the uh, connection over HTTPS or WSS. So they're separate keys. Um, we make sure to use the secure WebSocket protocol, the WSS protocol, to talk to the servers. But the one of the reasons we do this is that we use username and password authentication the very first time. So when you're registering a server, in the client and saying, okay, I have access to this server, I am known as this user, and here's my password. It only uses that once to establish that the server is there, go ahead and log in, and then the client automatically registers its SSL certificate with that server, and then discards knowledge of all its password stuff, and then all future connections to that server will use the SSL certificate instead. So we tried to automate that. What this means is that the option I mentioned on the server where you can disable the username and password authentication actually is a nice way of locking down your servers as well because it means that in order to get access to one of your servers, you have to send the SSL certificate that was generated by the client to your system administrator and he will add it to the server for you and associate it with a username and password. So the user doesn't even need to know which user they're logging in under if you want to create a user for them on the fly or get, maybe generate different users for each of them, for them on different servers and stuff. You can use the same cert to associate with whatever user you create for them. Um, where am I? Oh, import export. What if you have a whole host of servers that you just got all set up in your client and then you realize, wait a minute, this is on my laptop, I'm getting a new laptop. I don't want to go through the process of remembering all of my settings for all of my servers and all my key, reassociate all my keys on all the servers. You don't have to worry about that. The client has the ability to export all of your settings from that client uh, so that you can import it to another client on another system. So that brings along all your SSL keys, that brings along all the servers that you remembered and talked to, so it's basically like a bulk transfer of one to another. So you can literally set up different clients using the same keys, so it doesn't matter which system you're on, you still get all the information about all your servers. One of the other things I want to mention, I don't think I mentioned it on the slide here. Mm. Yes, I do. Okay, the third point here. I keep mentioning these SSL keys and stuff like that. We don't trust the OS. If you're running the win this client on Windows or you're running this client on Mac, we don't trust those operating systems to not leak your settings, your SSL keys, things like that, to other stuff on the system. So what we actually do in the client is we actually save all those inside a password protected encrypted file. It's a PSX12, I think, it's an SSL uh, format. So that you have, when you start up the client, you type in your password to unlock the settings on that system and that unlocks and opens up all the keys to the client so then it can talk to all the servers and things like that. And that's one way that we do um, security, just to, again, try to secure your stuff and your settings, even from other applications on the same operating system. All right, so let me just give you a few examples of what this looks like in the graphical client. We have a connection manager. It's primarily a tray application. So if you look here on the bottom right, I'm sorry if it's a little difficult to see. This is just a simple screenshot. 
It's the little uh, application there. The yellow coloring to it means that you have a message from one of your servers about something. So that event system that I was telling you about, something came through with a message that was a high enough priority that it changes color to yellow and alerts you that, hey, this server is trying to tell you something important. In this case, one of my systems has updates available. Um, you can also see there, if you look in the tray, the menu, I have my local system because this is a TrueOS system. You will never see that on Windows or Mac because there is no, obviously, local server on those. Um, but I've created a sample group called Test Group. And you can see that it actually shows up in the menu and you can do cascading menus or groups of all your servers however you would like. And it actually, in the messages, it tells you specifically which server is sending which message. So it gives you a summary of the message and the ID or the information about the server too. And if you click on that, it takes you straight to the configuration page for that server, for that subsystem. So if I were to click on this updates available message in the client, it'll automatically open the full interface talking to local system on the update page to actually address whatever concerns there are that came in the message. In this case, that there are updates available and maybe I want to start updates. Um, so it's very easy to add new groups. It's very easy to add new connections. It's drag and drop capable too, so you can move servers from group to group depending on you know if needs change. We kind of expect that. I don't really can't really think of anything else to mention with regards to this. So if there's no questions about the connection manager, I'll go on to the next little bit. Here's an example of what we're calling the main page. The moment you say, hey, in the client, I want to open up my local system it, or some other system, it opens this page. This is the front page for the configuration for that particular system. Um, this is actually a slightly old screenshot. Now we have dual columns and stuff and stuff, things like that, but it's the same basic idea. So there's various groups of uh, subsystems that are available. This is the pluggable nature of the API system in the back end that I mentioned. So various options will show up or not show up depending on the capabilities of the system itself. So most of the external utilities like Life Preserver that I mentioned will appear underneath the utilities category. So that's typically where you see things come and go depending on what you have installed on the system. A lot of the stuff in system management for instance is using the base FreeBSD libraries to do stuff corresponding to the base operating system itself. So for instance, uh, managing your users on the system. Um, task manager is kind of like a uh, version of top. You can see all your CPUs, see the temperatures, you can see all the running processes and kill a process if you need to. It's very, very slick with regards to that. Service manager, I want to make sure that Apache starts up on boot and I want to start it right now or you know things like that. Um, do you need to change your firewall settings? You can do that here too. If you're using IPFW, I do need to make that distinction. This uh, API class that we have for SysADM is only for IPFW. Um, we could write one for PF sometime, we just haven't. And then uh, Boot Environment Manager. This is actually really, really important for TrueOS and anybody on FreeBSD that's using a pure ZFS system with boot environment support, we actually have a full manager for that. So you can see all your boot environments. You can activate which one you want to reboot into when you reboot the system. Um, there's actually an option within it, uh, yeah, this is an old screenshot, so it doesn't show up, but there's actually an option in here as well to say, okay, I want to reboot my server, I can go through and do that, if you have wheel group permissions, if you have full permissions on the system. Um, things of that nature. Uh, the server settings, that would be things like managing the keys associated with different users. So if you, again, if you're in the, a full access user in the wheel group, you can actually manage, oh, this user is associated with this key, but they just let go, got let go from the company, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll nuke that so they can't log into our systems anymore. Things like that. Um, we also have a full package manager. So and that's just a front end for the PKG utility. We call it the App Cafe for historical reasons because this grew out of PCBSD and we've always had the App Cafe for our graphical front end. So I think I have some examples here. Yeah, so I mentioned the App Cafe. Here's just an example of what it'll look like. So you can see things like uh, all your package audit information. It'll actually show all of that on this list as well. So for instance, right now, LibreOffice has a security vulnerability, which, to be honest, isn't all that unsurprising. Um, but it'll show all that. But it not only does it say which package has a security vulnerability, it'll also warn you if your package depends on a package which has a security vulnerability. So the security vulnerability often isn't in the top level application. It's more often than not in one of the libraries 
library packages that the application uses. So it actually flags the distinctions there so you can keep track of your system. Um, we also have the ability to automatically clean. And basically, it's the interface to all of PKG. You can lock packages, you can unlock packages, you can go to the Browse tab and actually browse your package repository with a really, really smart search functionality. I, I like the search functionality a whole lot better than PKG's search functionality. It finds a whole lot more information and stuff, and you can see all the information about each of the individual packages. Almost like fresh ports, but with more information <laughs> because it's reading the package database directly and showing all the information it possibly can in a very intuitive way. Move on. All right, the task manager I mentioned. So this is just a quick screenshot of what the task manager would look like. This is on a relatively small, I think it's probably my laptop that I took the screenshot on. So it's like an i5 or i7 with four cores. So you can see that I'm, what percentage I'm using on each core, what the temperature of each CPU is. So you can see if something starts to get a little warm. Um, amount of memory used. You'll notice that it does have the different gradients and the different bars associated with the different types of memory. So if you actually highlight your mouse over it in the tooltip, it will actually show you the full stats and the full breakdown of this much free, you know, this much used, this much wired, this much, you know, it shows you that whole breakdown. And then you have the whole process list underneath as well. Again, screenshot's a little out of date. It looks slightly different in the process list, like we flag root processes a little bit more and stuff like that now. But it, it shows you the basic idea. The update manager that I mentioned, this is the front end for TrueOS's update mechanism. So you can see, hey, you have package updates available. And if you have the details box checked, you can actually scroll through and see all the updates. In this case, it's PKG. Um, if you have ZFS with boot environments, this will automatically use that as well. And then the settings tab gives you access to all the other settings associated with the TrueOS update mechanism. So for instance, which package repository are you talking to? In our case, it's the stable repository or the unstable repository. I know we have imaginative names. Uh, and then we also have the capability to put into there, no, I want to use some custom package repository. I have my own package repository that I build with Poudre on some server over here. You can do that as well. You can say, oh, no, custom repo, and then give it the URL to the custom repo. So it gives you all sorts of things like that. All right, now before I go on to the bridge, are there any questions about the client? I'm kind of covering a lot of stuff and I'm going through it very, very quickly. So I like to take breaks and see if, make sure I'm not steamrolling anybody. All right, I'll go into the bridge now. It is experimental. So note the big red warning. Um, this is a project that we are still working on specifically to address these fundamental questions. What if you have a server that doesn't have a static IP? Now, that generally sounds really, really ludicrous. Why would you give a server a dynamic address? Because you can never find it. But remember that from the TrueOS perspective, every FreeBSD system is a server. That's where the SysADM server is running. So it could be your desktop systems or your laptops. Those, you might want DHCP used. So how do you find those from a system administrator perspective if they're roaming around the network? Um, what about servers that are behind a corporate firewall, for instance? Say I've got some blocked off network room in the back closet, which can only be accessed through like a VPN tunnel or some other thing like that, but it's not exposed to the network that you're currently on. How would you be able to access those if you're the one that's roaming and not them? Um, the bridge is designed more like an announcement server to solve those kinds of issues. Um, it is designed to run on a small, statically assigned, but publicly available system. So this could be something up in a cloud provider, um, something really, really small and light, basically so that the servers, when they start up, connect to the bridge to announce themselves and say, hey, I am here and I am at this IP address, but then your clients also connect to the bridge to find out what other servers are available. So it's, it's a middleman to talk to. Again, with our focus on security, we wanted to specifically design the bridge to be completely untrusted. 
especially if you're putting it up on some public uh, cloud hosting provider and stuff, you want to make sure that nothing else is logging all the traffic in and out and capturing your SSL keys or you know, doing whatever it is. So what we did is we set this up to actually utilize a completely different set of SSL keys. So on the server and on the client, in that SSL certificate bundle that I mentioned, we don't just have one pair, we have two pairs. We have one to talk to a, if you're on the client side, we have one to talk to the servers and authenticate with a server, and one to talk to the bridge and authenticate with a bridge, and they never mix. After connecting to a bridge, what this does is you use the bridge certificate to finish the authentication with a bridge, saying, yes, this system is allowed to announce itself on this bridge. It has the proper certificate to be allowed to do that. And then it registers its IP and stuff. But then when it actually talks to the server on the other side of the bridge, it encrypts all the traffic with the other certificate. So literally, the bridge is just getting a stream of encrypted traffic from the ser between the server and the client and relaying that rather than, um, rather than still getting it all in plain text where it can sniff on it and capture what everybody is doing on there because we're trying to make sure it is completely untrusted. That's actually the thing that's causing most of the trouble in the bridge project right now is that relay mechanisms and the encryption within the encryption. But basic proofs of concept are all there. So the way it works is we tried to make it possible that you only need to connect your server to a bridge once, but it registers all of the MD5s of the SSL certificates that are allowed to authenticate with it. So for instance, if you have 100 servers connect to the bridge to announce themselves, each of them has an associated list saying, hey, if a client connects and says, I can connect to a server with this MD5. It matches up the MD5s from the client and server and says, oh, and the bridge will uh, tell the client, hey, you have servers available here, 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 and here. And it'll also tell the servers, hey, you have clients available here, 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 and here. Question? Um, don't use MD5. Don't use MD5. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a recommendation? That was just something that I can put in pretty quickly. Okay. Yes, all the brute force detection and blacklisting for the server is tunable. So you can configure how many times it takes before something gets automatically put on the blacklist. You can automatically add things to the blacklist or do it programmatically if you would like. Um, you can also change the timeout for th how long things should stay on the blacklist. So should things stay on there permanently or do you just want to block them for a day and a half? You know, you can, you can tune all of that as much as you want. Yes, uh, for the purposes of the recording, I'm just going to repeat a little bit of what you said. <laughs> Basically, you have to be really careful with the brute force so that they don't typically stay connected and try three times and fail. They'll connect once, try once, disconnect, reconnect, try again. Um, the SysADM server actually is aware of that right away. So it doesn't look at uh, attempts per connection. It looks at attempts from IP. And it does that, and it, I think it only wipes out the attempts after it doesn't hear from an IP for, again, the, the designated timeout time, which is configurable. So again, we've tried to think about things from the security perspective. So MD5, changing MD5 to SHA-256 is probably something we could do fairly easily, because I hadn't thought about that. I just used it. Um, but yeah, a lot of the other things I'm glad to hear about. 
All right, let's go on. Oh, I'm already near the end. Okay, so just to sum up for those of you that were asleep, um, <laughs> it's a framework designed to give you a static system API for managing your FreeBSD systems without a database, without breaking your muscle memory of how you manage your FreeBSD systems. If you're, you, you have one person using SysADM to administer your server, you can still log in with SSH and not have to worry that he's making typos and you know, errors in various files because he's just not as familiar with FreeBSD as you are. This helps alleviate that, but it also doesn't prevent you from being able to do your standard system administration utilities. Maybe you already have scripts set up that you use to provision systems. This doesn't break that. You can continue to use that as much as you want because the FreeBSD configuration is the source of truth. SysADM is just a relay for a user to connect and read what the system state is without actually doing anything in between to try and fake it or provide a database which can get out of sync with the FreeBSD system itself. So that's one of the main keys, uh, key takeaways of the SysADM system. Um, oh, this isn't theoretical. This isn't something that, oh yeah, we've been playing with it, it kind of works and stuff like that. No, we've been running this on TrueOS in production for the last year or more. It's stable, it's reliable, it works very, very well, and it also gives us a very, very consistent and easy system to be able to add new functionality into as things change on FreeBSD. For instance, I mentioned IO cage earlier. That's one that I'm adding right now, and I can do it in a very consistent, very modular way without touching all the stuff which already works. So it get, makes the bar of entry for people that do want to send in uh, changes, that do want to send in contributions for new types of API calls, it lowers that bar of entry very, very considerably because you don't have to worry about touching all the other API calls. You can just do your block, and it only impacts your block. And here's a couple uh, websites about additional information about SysADM. I can actually bring up the uh, API reference guide right after we're done here if you would like so you can actually see all the various classes that we've got. Um, I have to really have to give props to the IX Systems Docs team, which we have a number of them here with us today. They make sure that the API documentation here is top notch. Not only do we provide full examples of how to send a request to the server for every single one of the different API calls for both the HTTP format and the WebSocket format, but you also get reply structures. So if you are like me, a developer, where you're trying to automate the usage of all of these APIs, you don't have to worry about having one there to run the command against it to actually see what comes back so you can write your parsing rules for it. All of that is in the documentation, so you can literally just with this one document write your own complete API user to talk to a SysADM server and do whatever it is that you would need because everything is in the documentation. Requests, replies, the whole nine yards, what's optional, what's available, stuff like that. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. Okay, what things could FreeBSD do to make my life easier? Um, a number of the C libraries that we use for SysADM are not very well documented because they were written to be used by particular base utilities. Case in point, the networking libraries. Um, most of them were designed to be used by ifconfig. So, if you're actually trying to use those libraries yourself and you're actually just reading through the includes and reading through the other stuff, it's often very hard to find the proper way to use a particular object or a particular library. So maybe a little bit better documentation of the underlying structures rather than just the man page for ifconfig would be useful. Um, Another good way would be for FreeBSD source committers who actually work on ifconfig, who write 
a lot of the networking code and stuff, if they also want to write the APIs for SysADM to do you know, whatever it is. That would make things a whole lot easier as well because in, if you write it once, just copy and paste it over here too so that this does the same thing. That might make it easy as well. That way we have dual compatibility for everybody. And then if something changes on the FreeBSD side, you just need to go and modify it here a little bit without breaking any of your end users who are using the API because the whole point of SysADM is so that we don't change the API for users and for end users, so that it doesn't matter what version of FreeBSD you're working on, the same API call does the same thing, even if the underlying C libraries or the underlying configuration files get moved or changed. So you used uh, the magic of fuzzy users for the problem of this. <laughs> In the API formats I have found that there are generally, there is a very specific chain or things that need to be supported. Um, so one of the things that FreeBSD, I'm gonna repeat the question here because I realized I didn't. <laughs> one of the things that could be done in the FreeBSD libraries to help with this is to see if you can support the same types of operations in a very clear manner. One, list. What is the current state? What is the current blah? You know, whatever it is. Um, two, uh, list configuration, because that is often different from the current state, especially when you come to networking, because people can run ifconfig to change the state without actually changing the default configuration. Um, so you need listing options for both of those, but then you need set operations for both of those as well. So basically read and write is the best way to think about it. But you need to have them distinct, and you need to have them distinct for I am writing configuration or I am writing to system state at the moment and actually changing the live system. So that's the main breakdown for things that tend to uh, need to be done in APIs. So I have listing functions for the current system, or listing functions for the configuration, listing functions for the state, and then modification functions for the system them configuration and modification functions for the system state. And that's just the general breakdown of the flow of the APIs. And it could be anything. So what we do is in the individual API classes, we'll break things down further. So for instance, user system, will do all the P, uh, PW stuff to listen to the users, look at the password database, change the password, stuff like that. But it's the same basic flow. List what's there, list what's running, change what's there, change what's running. Other questions? Yes, sir. The question was, can you batch operations across multiple servers? At the moment, not through the client. We are planning to add that type of functionality later but enabling that functionality also makes a somewhat dangerous assumption, which is why we haven't added it yet, because we want to be careful with it. Making the same operation across a fleet of servers comes with the assumption that all the servers are the same. <laughs> and this is a very, very dangerous assumption in many cases, particularly if you're doing something like networking, because one server might have a different network device or a different network card, than another server, so the actually sending the same set of commands might not work. You might have to tune the commands a little bit for each of the individual servers. So we're trying to be very, very careful about how we implement that, which is why it is not there yet. But yes, it is on the roadmap eventually for bulk operations across a fleet of servers. Yes? Yes, uh, the question was, is there any possibility for scripting of operations um, for the servers? And yes, it's actually there right now, and that's what the API is. By providing the HTTP access and the WebSocket access, we've made it very, very easy to script in a shell script or whatever, establish a connection to a server, and then send these commands. 
So we actually do this in our testing framework as well. So we know that the automation works. We actually have a little tool that we wrote, which is a shell script, where I think it pulls in one tiny like NPM utility or something like that just to do the connection to the WebSocket server in particular, because that's a little bit harder from a shell, shell script. Um, but once you have that, basically it just sends the bulk JSON through the tunnel and then listens to the replies and then closes down. That's actually how we test all our API calls before we commit them um, to our repo, because we want to make sure that if it's there, it works. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, the question was basically is there integration with other of some of the other automatic deployment tools like Ansible, Puppet, was it Chef? There's a whole yeah. host of them. Um, we do not have that written into it directly. Obviously, you could write an API class for it if you would like for your particular deployment system. Um, but in addition to that, we do have a much more generic way of integrating with those. We have a dispatcher system within the sysadm server itself, which is just a very generic low-level class to tell, so that when you connect, you can tell the server, hey, I need you to run my script over there, whatever it is, it could be Ansible, it could be one of these other ones, keep track of the process, let me know the return from that, and let me know when it's done. So it's a very low-level way to basically run any kind of script on the system, even if it's an automatic you know, shell script or something that you wrote up just for your servers, you can hook that in as well through the dispatcher system without having to go through the full uh, process of writing an API just for your small script. Yes, it actually reports everything. It reports the status that the script returns. So, well, script, I'm gonna say a binary. All right, it could be anything. Um, it returns whether the return code from it, it returns the standard output and standard error from it, um, and it also sends out via the event system updates on that process while it is running as well. So if you want to look at the, if it's something that spits out to standard out, you know, on occasion, if it's something that runs for like three hours, for instance, and every 10 minutes it sends a status update to the um, standard out, Sys uh, SysADM Dispatcher will capture that and you can either ask the dispatcher system saying, hey, what's the update on this process? That It gives you a process ID or you can give it a process ID when you start a dispatcher process. Um, you, so you can ask directly, hey, what's the current status of this process? Or you can just sit back and listen for the dispatcher events saying, hey, this process is now at, you know, this state. So it really is up to you and it's a low level functionality for it. Sorry, I just realized I should probably move the mouse so the screensaver doesn't come on. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, the question was, is there a capability for clustering the servers for administration purposes? So for instance, all the certificates for who is allowed to access what are available on some other you know, central server rather than each of the individual servers. At the moment, no. At the moment, each server is treated atomically as its own unit. Again, when we start going to bulk server operations though, we are going to start adding a lot more of that clustering into it because that ties into the exact same framework for which cluster of systems are to be treated as identical so that you can do all these bulk operations to them and in that case they also have identical configuration and stuff like that. So that's gonna tie into that system once it's done. Other questions? I think I've got enough for probably two left. Yes sir. Okay, race conditions about the current state of the system and something else asking for the state of the system, which one happens first and stuff. Um, 
We don't deal with too many race conditions themselves because they happen so quickly. Um, one of the things that we do in the server itself, it is, it is highly multi-threaded. So every single request that comes in via WebSocket or um, HTTP actually gets a dedicated thread just to evaluate that request and send it back. So you don't have to worry about one person's request, which does take three hours, slowing down anything else that other people, other connections or requests are doing. So you can literally send batch requests. Um, with regards to system state, that also hooks into the event system. For a lot of them, if you change the state of some particular system, it very often generates an event about that system saying, hey, this system state changed. We also have uh, logging mechanisms built into the server by default. So if a user makes a state change request, all of those get logged into the system as well. So you can go back through your logs later and figure out, wait a minute, who was the Dumbo that said do you know, such and such a thing? So we try to do all of that, and it's mainly through the event system. Other questions? All right, last one. Um, for modules, do you control individual systems? Um, is there some kind of package format so that you can basically one person writes a package to some arbitrary individual thing that they want to control, but all these people are actually able to do it through the writing of this thing, even though every single package is being written for you? Mm -hmm. Um, the question was a, was a way to basically have package management and configuration, gener very generic system for people to upload package configuration options, which can be used by, sys by SysADM, and then uploaded to some global repo or whatever for everybody to download that configuration. Um, not at the moment. Right now, every, all the APIs are written as single C++ files within the source tree. They each, ha each of the classes have their own dedicated C++ file, and then you have to put like two lines into two of the other files just to say, oh yeah, we do have a new file. And this adds this class. Um, we could start adding some kind of runtime method of detecting and loading optional things as well. I've actually done a lot of that for some of my other utilities. I just haven't started looking at that for SysADM yet. So if you have ideas for formats and how you would like that to look, by all means, please talk to me afterwards and we might be able to work something out. All right. One last question. There we go. I'm sorry, I missed that. What? OK. Um, <laughs> From IRC channel, they want to know if TrueOS has adopted, what was it, LibTrue? I really don't know what LibTrue is. <laughs> I am, <laughs> apparently not. Apparently we can't handle the truth on TrueOS. But um, by all means, you can talk to me afterwards and we'll see what that is. I really don't even know what that is, so I'll just punt on that. Oh, we are bleeding edge. <laughs> oh, it's 12 hours. Okay, yeah, we might not have that yet then. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to say thank you very much. If you have any further questions or want to see some of the API documentation, by all means come up afterwards and I'll throw them up on the screen so you can start looking through some of this.